Welcome to the third installment in Rich Vedrick Tells You How to Do Things with Your Generators in Your House. First video, I talked about all the different types of generators. Second one, I talked about how to modify the generator receptacle to break neutral ground bonds. If you haven't watched that, the short take is, if you have more than one neutral ground bond in a system, you generate an unsafe condition. That's because current takes the path, not of least resistance, but all paths, and the amplitude varies based on the resistance of each path. So if you have two neutral ground bonds, the neutral current, that's the difference between phase A and phase B, splits and goes on both the neutral and the ground, creating an unsafe condition. Don't do that. We want to jump to the end really quick so you can see what it's going to look like. I'm going to show you how I modified my own generator and then how I added a switch to choose between bonded and floated neutral. But we have to talk about safety first. I apologize, but it's necessary. Now, I'm not telling you that you're qualified to make any of the modifications to your generator just because you are YouTube certified and watch the video. Clearly, I'm comfortable doing this. This is a workbench where I modify and repair electronics. I'm an electrical engineer. I went to school for this. I designed building power systems. I understand generators. I'm qualified to do the work that I'm doing on my own personal equipment. So naturally, legally speaking, I'm not saying that just because you watch this video, you're allowed to do this. I'm not telling you to do it. And I'm certainly not observing or certifying any work that you could possibly do. You have to proceed at your own risk. If you damage something, that's not my fault, that's yours, you're the one that did it. If you wanna reach out to a qualified electrician and see if they're willing to help you, maybe they will. And they're taking on some liability themselves though. But it's unsafe to have two neutral ground bonds, but it's also equally unsafe to have a floating neutral generator utilized in a portable sense. So this is electricity, you can get hurt, you have to be careful. If you're not qualified to work with electrical wiring and to make modifications to things and accept that if you break something or damage something or hurt someone because you made a modification that's on you and you alone. Okay, now we got that out of the way. Let's have some fun. Take a look at what this generator looks like on the inside. So we're going to use a heavy duty toggle switch and some number 10 THHN and modify my standby portable generator to select between floating neutral and bonded neutral. First thing we're going to do is simply remove our cover. All right. Here is where you can see our neutral ground bond. We have our ground, we have our neutral. This is where they're bonded together at the same point. These go to your house. This is a neutral conductor that's coming from the generator itself. So if we want to isolate these, we simply loosen this, take this conductor, and land it on here. We're going to lift that. And we can just go ahead and put this back because we have to leave our ground on the chassis. We torque that down when we're all done. Next, we just have this to loosen. And this was just a spare stud. I was lucky enough to just have a spare stud sitting here. So if you didn't, then you'd have to just float these elsewhere. But because I have a generator that appears to really be configured for one or the other, if you ask me, that's why they have it the way they do. Now I have a floating neutral generator. That's all it took. A couple bolts, take the cover off, take a look at what I got. And now I have a floating neutral generator. If I want to switch and toggle between floating and bonded, I just have to connect these two. So that's what I'd like to do next. Add this toggle switch so I can flip it and either open the circuit, and these are floating, and then I can tie it to my house as normal, or close it, and these two are connected, and now I can use it in a standalone configuration. So let's spend the time to figure out what that's gonna look like. Now in my case, you can see I have this back box here. So I have a solid piece of loom that goes from here into here. Keep everything nice and weather tight and sealed. So ideally, I'd fish my new wire up through here and keep this nice and sealed. So what's it look like on the front? So now I got this plate and I know that the box is held by these screws all the way around. So the first thing I have to do is take all those screws off and loosen and take the back off and see what does it look like with the back off. Now if we're gonna do this, the only space available is actually right here between these two. If we look inside, we can see 
everything's pretty busy so should have seen that coming that's okay so well we got a gap we got a gap right here of adequate height so that's exactly where this toggle switch is going to go it'll go in this orientation because this is off which means it's lifted and that is down which means it's bonded and grounded so i think that orientation makes sense it also keeps the connections up a little higher so the next thing to do is simply drill a hole and then once that hole's drilled and i like the fitment of that we'll push some wire through make some connections okay so now we have to make up our little jumpers and the reason we're going to make up jumpers is this switch is rated for 20 amps at 120 volts or 200 at 18 amps at 250 volts so we actually have to run both of these contacts in parallel. I have a couple of ways I could do that. I could jump from here to here and jump from there to there, or I could just have a wire coming off each, which is basically what this terminal is designed for. I'd rather just have one conductor on each of these terminals. So we simply remove that. Perfect, see? Isn't that nice? But we need to heat shrink this. So first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna make up all these connections. Now I only have a couple that I have to make up. So how I do that is I take my wire strippers and I strip them for the stranded position. Now I have my ratchet and crimper. I typically load this first. So that way it's being held in position because it won't stay on the wire otherwise. Ratchet that down. And that's a good crimp. Do that a couple more times. So now these can land on here, and then I'll have lever nuts for each one. Let me make that up. With the magic of cameras, so now we have our connections. And then the next thing to do is to have this. So we've heat shrunk all of our ends and now we're sitting pretty good to go. It is time to, just for good measure, we'll wrap that up with a little bit of tape. A little bit of 3M Super 33 Plus just to keep anything from incidentally touching these. While it is neutral and ground, again, we don't wanna create any inadvertent bonds anywhere. So now we got that nice and insulated. Let's add our lever nuts. So we just simply add our wires in. Now one of the things I did was try to make sure I group them up so that way they are grouped together. The cool thing about lever nuts is you can see how far your conductor is inserted. And obviously we're making sure that we're utilizing these pairs are together and those pairs are together because that's how the switch works. No, that's pinched down, but you can see that one popped out a little bit. So again, that's why we like lever nuts. We can see that one pulls out because it's not fully inserted. So we want to make sure that we get it in a spot where we don't have that issue. And because you can see what you're doing, there we go. Now we're good. Properly used, these will not come off. You just have to make sure you properly use them. So I got this bundle and this bundle. I'm probably going to zip tie these together just so that that way I take any strain off these individual connectors. I want to make sure that I have some strain relief. So I'll zip tie that. Then we'll work this inside of our cabinet. We're probably going to bend these at 90 degree angles to meet up with our conductors. So I have a zip tie to prevent, remember, strain relief at all times. Always have strain relief. So these are my conductors coming from down there. They don't actually, doesn't actually matter which is which, right? Because I'm just making that connection, one of, the ten, one of the two. So now I just simply have to feed this big bundle through this hole. Now, next thing for us to do is put our connectors on and then terminate those. This time we have a different crimper, uh, at least a different die. This die is sized specifically for insulated terminals. You can see it gives us a dot. It, uh, it's a nice little finish there. I like this crimper. 
besides being ratcheting, it's always important to make sure that it's got exchangeable dies, right? So you can switch that out. But always make sure that you're using the right die for the right purpose. All right, now we're pretty close. Our next step is to land each of these wires. So this one is gonna land here with the ground, and then this one's gonna land here with the neutrals. So when you're landing and choosing what goes where, you have to recognize that the way that connectors are bent will sometimes have play a role. So this one luckily can fit right underneath. This one can fit right on top. You're always gonna need a little bit of offset. There we go. Nice and tight, like a toyga, if you know what that's from. Then you like Austin Powers. So, we wanna make sure we can't rotate, and you can see we can rotate. So that means this isn't tight enough yet. And I'm running into some issues with how those are landed, and it looks like this is popping up at an angle. So I'm actually gonna back that off and try again. So what I did is I actually loosened this wire, one of my phase conductors, so that way I could get it, I could get these wires underneath and I could have a better splay. So I actually have one of these back, then these two, then that one, so that way it fits nice and tight. And then I just gotta put this back. So the way that, awesome, the way that this is configured, as you got phase conductor in black, phase conductor in red, that's your 240 volt AC, and then you got your neutral. Let me show that tight one here. Awesome. So now you can see we got this nice and tight. That's good to go. We got that nice and tight. And we have completed our modification of our gem set. Put that off because we're not savages. So the next thing to do, now that that's complete, I can do a couple things. I can take a measurement here, and I should notice that they're not bonded with the switch open, and they're bonded with the switch closed. So let's go ahead and set that up. So what we're going to do is we're just going to take our multimeter, and we're going to look for resistance. DC resistance, none. Now let's close the switch. And there we go. So we've just installed a switch to go between floating and bonded neutrals. Awesome. Now let's put our cover back on. Taking care to make sure that this grommet is in the correct location. Just like that. This is also limiting the amount of torque I can put on it, right? I can only get so much torque with my with a screwdriver. But I got my factory grommet, and honestly, you look at that, and you probably wouldn't know that I did anything to this generator. And we have our final configuration. This is our switch to ground it or to lift it. Now that should be labeled, and I'll probably put a label right here because I don't want to... There's, maybe I could print something and have a little label maker, you know, lift and ground. But I have to label that in case somebody else goes to use it. But I know that grounded, lifted. I think that makes sense. Obviously, the rubber boot kind of looks in place. Other than the janky label, I'm probably going to add on to it. You really wouldn't know that I did anything to it. Now I can, I'm going to start this. I'm going to run it, and I'm actually going to run it on my house and uh, it's kind of like that annual load. Just get some load on it, burn through some gas, get some fresh gas in it, get it ready to go. Don't expect, I mean, we're all some storms coming up. But. So yeah, this is the Generac. And that's the connection I use to take it to my house. It's a nice little extension cord. So there we go. We've modified it. Any questions, let me know.